Good morning. Thank you, Ty. Yes, yes. Welcome to worship with Susanna Wesley United Methodist Church. My name is Andrew Connard. I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad that you're connected with us in worship. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we're so glad that you're here. Um, and today, a little bit later in the worship service, we'll be welcoming new members, so it's a special day here in the life of the church. For those of you that are here in the worship center, we want to give special time for you to be able to say hello to those that you may not know or aren't as familiar with and say, I'm so glad you're here for worship. So in just a moment, will you take a look around and see if there's folks that you don't know or maybe aren't as familiar with? You might go up to them, introduce yourself and say, I'm so glad that you're here today. And then we'll invite you all to remain standing and we'll join in our responsive reading, the Susanna Wesley welcome as our liturgist Linda Holmquist will lead us. Will you please stand and welcome your neighbors this morning? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. We build diverse Christian communities where God's love is in action. We seek to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. We connect with God and our neighbors through spiritual practices to worship, study, serve, give, and share. All people are welcome with no exceptions. You can be who you are, you can be any way you are, and you are loved. God speaks to us through words and music. I invite you to continue standing and join in singing our opening song.
Will you please be seated? And as you're seated, I invite you to join with me as we go to God in prayer. Will you pray with me? We believe, O oh Lord, that you have not abandoned us to the dim light of our own reason and guidance to lead us in the way that leads to life but instead that you have revealed in Holy Scripture what is necessary for us to believe and practice. How noble and excellent are your guidelines. How sublime and enlightening the truth of your Son, Jesus. How persuasive and how strong the influence of your Holy Spirit. Our delight shall always be in your guidance, and we will not forget your word. Amen. Listen to, the, to God's word for us from the Old Testament, a reading from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. All of you who are thirsty, come to the water. Whoever has no money, come buy food and eat. Without money, at no cost, buy wine and milk. Why spend money for what isn't food and your earnings for, for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Enjoy the richest of feasts. Listen and come to me. Listen and you will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful loyalty of David. Look, I made him a witness to the peoples, a prince and a commander of peoples. Look, you will call a nation you don't know. A nation you don't know will run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, who has glorified you. Seek the Lord when he can still be found. Call him while he is yet near. Let the wicked abandon their ways and the sinful their schemes. Let them return to the Lord so that he may have mercy on them. To our God, because he is generous with forgiveness. My plans aren't your plans, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my plans higher than your plans. During this season of Lent, we are singing the psalms so that we might reflect on them in a different way. I'll remind you that we'll start by uh, hearing the refrain once on the piano. I'll sing the refrain once, and then we'll all join in the refrain. And then when we get to the text, we'll sing uh, all of the words that are to the left of the vertical line on one note, and then uh, sing the rest of the words to subsequent notes. And we'll sing that using the same tone we've been singing since the beginning of Lent. I invite you to join me as we sing Psalm 63. My soul is thirsty for you. Joy. 
Listen to God's word for us from the New Testament, a reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. Brothers and sisters, I want you to be sure of the fact that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all went through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. However, God was unhappy with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. These things were examples for us, so we won't crave evil things like they did. Don't worship false gods like some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they got up to play. Let's not practice sexual immorality like some of them did, and 23,000 died in one day. Let's not test Christ like some of them did, and were killed by the snakes. Let's not grumble like some of them did and were killed by the destroyer. These things happened to them as an example and were written as a warning for us to whom the end of time has come. So those who think they are standing need to watch out or else they may fall. No temptation has seized you that isn't common for people, but God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond your abilities. He won't allow you to be, instead, with the temptation, God will also supply a way out so that you will be able to endure it. Will you please stand as you're able for reading the scripture? Listen to God's word for us from the gospel of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Some who were present on that occasion told Jesus about the Galileans, whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices. He replied, Do you think the suffering of these Galileans proves that they were more sinful than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. What about those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were more guilty of wrongdoing than everyone else who lives in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. Jesus told this parable. A man owned a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He said to his gardener, look, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree for the past three years, and I've never found any. Cut it down. Why should it continue depleting the soil's nutrients? The gardener responded, Lord, give it one more year, and I will dig around it and give it fertilizer. Maybe it will produce fruit next year. If not, then you can cut it down. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. You may be seated. Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Did I lose my microphone? I think so. I don't know if I need a new battery. My battery is out. Randy, could you get a 9-volt battery? We're going to see if we can get that fixed up. Or you got a 9-volt here. How about now? All right, and the friends online can hear us? Good, good, good. Tell me, (laughs) tell me again. (laughs) What is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? 
This is one of the, uh, the end of a poem called The Summer Day. Now, the poem didn't end exactly like I just delivered it because Mary Oliver didn't have to worry about her battery pack going out in the middle of writing the poem. And of course, when you're reading a poem like that, you can just continue on. But poetry, I find, it can be a gift that helps connect us with ourselves, with other people, and it can also be a gift that connects us with God. Certainly, there are uh, major portions of the scripture that are written in verse or written in poetry, particularly if you would know the original language. The Psalms, for example, many of those written in a way that we might interpret as poetry. And this particular line from this poem helps us connect with our theme for today. Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? As we continue our journey towards Easter, our series gathered up in Jesus invites us to self-examination. It reminds us that God is welcoming all together in Jesus Christ and, and that when we look around the world and realize that there's some change that might be needed, we find that it might actually start with ourselves. Change towards lives in God's kingdom starts with connections and not with condemnation. Two weeks ago in our series, we took a closer look at temptation, both Jesus' temptation and the temptation that we face in our own lives. We remember that we always have an opportunity to say yes or no to God. Yet the good news is that Jesus gives us the strength to face the temptations in our lives. Last week, we engaged Jesus' comparison of himself to a chicken. Do you remember that? As a mother hen, to remember that God's redeeming love in Jesus Christ is available to all people. And when we feel helpless and hopeless and alone, Christ offers us a place of protection, love, and support. And this week, we turn to fruit. Now, when I was growing up, our family took a vacation uh, in the summers to Colorado. And one of the things about Colorado that was always advertised when we would go out was Colorado peaches. And uh, the, the particular, uh, the, the blessing, uh, the joy of this fruit, and it's something that I really enjoyed. And we would go uh, in our, uh, to various destinations throughout the country, Um, And for many of those years, we drove a white Plymouth Voyager. This was an early minivan, or at least it seems to be within my memory. Of course, my parents sat up in front, and and, uh, my brother and I were in the very back row, the third row, and my sister sat in the middle, usually by a stack of luggage that we we had to pile up there, in addition to what we had on the roof as well. And we loved it in the back seat, my brother and I. We could play our games. We could play cards with each other. We had this particular version of Choose Your Own Adventure books that you'd roll dice, and there was a little cup holder on the side, and it was great. And it was also an excellent position to pick on my sister. (laughs) Now, I confess that there was some teasing, maybe a little hair pulling, and whatever it was, uh, certainly trying to get a reaction out of her. (laughs) It brings a little bit of a smile now, and I've been able to uh, joke uh, lovingly uh, with my sister about that these days, but but I really missed the mark back then. (laughs) I wasn't being such a a nice older brother. Uh, Neither of uh, us were. At at times, it was almost like I was trying to pick a fight with her. Uh, Maybe you have like this with your siblings, or maybe you can imagine what that might, might be like. Life seems full of opportunities to pick a fight, doesn't it? Chances to shift blame or to point fingers. It was somehow enhanced, it seems, over these several years with the pandemic and a still fraught political landscape. And it goes beyond our families, into our communities and and across nations. How do we have a political conversation these days? It seems that conversation isn't even the right word when we hear politicians talk to or about each other. Maybe we just kind of shout at each other. Imagine any number of commission or council or board meetings over the past months where it seems like it's turned into a shouting match. And, and then it seems like election season is, is all the time that maybe it's not a season at all. And sometimes gatherings seem to focus on increasing the fear of other people instead of trying to work together to find solutions. The enemy, it's their fault. They don't play fair. They aren't like us. They're not val- they don't value what we value. And we're all weaker because of them, wh- whoever them is. And it seems worse day by day or season by season. Weren't public debates designed to help work us together on a common ideas and vision and to try to uh, find solutions instead of making the other person look bad? Or did we kind of imagine that? I wonder if there's some of this going on in our scripture passage for today. Let's retake a look at Luke chapter 13, verse 1. Some who were present on that occasion told Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices. 
So who, who were those some who were present people? Well, they're just your average folks going about their everyday business and just trying to make sure that Jesus was up to date on the latest news, that he'd been paying attention. Was this just information? It, it seems like everyone has an agenda here, though. And so why did they tell Jesus this story? Or why did they pose this puzzle to him? Did they think that he hadn't heard this one yet? Now, we don't know about the events, uh, either of these events that are referred to here. We don't know anything about a tower of Siloam and its falling. We don't know any other information about the Galileans who were killed while making a sacrifices. None of the other gospel writers mention these events, and there isn't any other historical account identifying what happened here either. Of course, there's a speculation and rumor, and, and theologians try to do their best work, and, and yet despite the gospel accounts that makes him out to be a, a helpless at best, or sometimes wishy-washy at worst, it seems like the character of Pilate is depicted in other places as really a pretty terrible guy. Some say that he was exiled to this little backwater of the Roman Empire and that he proceeded to take it out on the locals at regular intervals. He was constantly rubbing the official divine status of the emperor in the face of the Jews who considered this to be blasphemy. He continually revoked the special status of the temple treasury and claimed funds for his own purposes. He frequently spoiled the religious festivals and feast days by making onerous public decrees that prohibited or limited their celebrations. And there was a story that there were rumors of an uprising coming to Jerusalem. So Pilate perhaps sent undercover soldiers into the temple to find and dispatch the ringleaders, which they did with what the Romans do very well, which is to put people to death. Right there on the courtyards of the temple, we hear, put to death for rumors and speculation. Perhaps those, some who were present in verse 1, were trying to get Jesus to take a side in a political debate. They might have been zealots who wanted Jesus to come out for their revolutionary agenda. They might have been the establishment hoping that he would have something to say to get Rome interested enough to care about their problems. Or they might have been people appalled that such a thing could happen and wanted someone to answer the question, why? 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 Now, this question seems to linger in our minds. It's mainly when troublesome or challenging events occur in our lives. And these two certainly in the scriptures seem to fit that bill. Why did Pilate kill those people in the temple nonetheless? Why did this tower collapse? Why did the condo building collapse? Why did Russia start a war with Ukraine? Why does the pandemic affect people in such drastically different ways? Why didn't I make another choice in that situation? Why did my friend have to die? Do you ever ask why? Do you ever wonder if bad things happen because of something that we've done wrong? Jesus replies clearly, were these people more sinful than others? No. No, they were not. Were they more guilty of wrongdoing than everyone else? No, Jesus tells us. They were not. He gives a definitive response here. But he continues by inviting us to repent, to change our hearts and lives. But, but wait a minute, Jesus, you just said that it's not a result of our sinfulness um, that caused these people to die so horribly, so why do I need to repent? It's not going to save me from death, will it? Faithful living doesn't prevent bad things from happening in our lives, so why try? Is it really worth the effort? A life of following Jesus isn't about dying or preventing death or trying to be a good luck charm against bad things happening in our lives. Instead, a life of following Jesus is about living, about seeking to be faithful to God, who isn't about who, it, it, being faithful to God, not about avoiding bad things. It's about having the opportunity to be a part of good things that are happening in the world. It's about being part of God's kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven and the re realization and the reality that God walks with us through difficult times. The good news is that Jesus gives our lives purpose and direction even when things like a tower falling or someone being put to death for no reason or any number of reasons that we might ask why. We don't always know. But we know that God is with us and that God's love invites us. And then Jesus shares this parable that essentially asks us, how are we going to live? 
The vineyard owner has found a, finds that a fig tree that he's planted hasn't produced fruit for three years, and he tells the gardener, cut it down. It doesn't need to waste the nutrients in the soil anymore. But the gardener speaks up for the tree, asking for more time, a chance to give it fertilizer, to give it care and attention. It may produce fruit in the following year. And I wonder if this parable invites us to consider what kind of tree will we be? Do we want to be one that just takes up space? <laughs> That's wasting the nutrients in the soil? Of course not. We want to produce fruit, fruit that will last, the fruit that means being a part of God's kingdom, that means turning the world upside down by love and not something that we can do on our own, but something that is possible through the power of the Holy Spirit, a place where the last will be first and the first will be last, a place where those that are hungry have enough food to eat, those that live in uncertainty and unsafety have comfort and peace and security. And this season, we can be a part of God's kingdom coming on earth. We can take care of our souls by fertilizing them with the spiritual practices as we move toward Easter. When we find in ourselves places that we've done wrong, when we need to confess and say that we're sorry, we can ask God to create in us a new heart, to begin again, that we might be trees and fruit, uh, produce fruit that lasts. We can be part of God's kingdom coming right here in Topeka and Shawnee County. We have the choice to live for God or live for any other number of ways. So, as Mary Oliver writes, tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Will you pray with me? Oh God, we confess that we make mistakes and we need your forgiveness. So in this time of quiet, oh God, just, just receive our prayers of confession. And if you have something that comes to mind, just, just offer it to God, just quietly under your breath. God, we're sorry for all the things that we've done wrong. Forgive us, we pray. Thank you for your love in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the opportunity to live as part of your kingdom. Inspire and encourage and empower us to be fruitful in your kingdom, to put your love in action, to love our neighbors, and to share your love. We offer all of these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. response today is take my life and let it be. It's found on page 399 in your hymnal. I invite you to stand as we sing.
You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite forward Paul and Jeannie Henson and Margie Newell to be received as members of Susanna Wesley United Methodist Church. Every other month, we have a new member Sunday inviting those that are part of the Connected with the Congregation to become members, um, and we welcome you to make that commitment in the life of the church. As they're making their way forward, I want to remind you that being a member here at Susanna Wesley means uh, saying yes to follow Jesus. It means being a part of the United Methodist Church mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And here at Susanna Wesley, to commit to these spiritual practices, to worship, study, serve, give, and share. And today, Paul and Jean and Margie are here to become members of Susanna Wesley United Methodist Church. So I have some questions for you uh, that have been asked about those joining uh, United Methodist Churches for a long time. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you reject the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and truly and earnestly repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the Old and New Testaments? According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? And as members of uh, Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? And as members of Susanna Wesley, will you faithfully participate in the ministries of the church and engage in spiritual practices to worship, study, serve, give, and share? Brothers and sisters, I commend to your love and care these persons we this day receive into this congregation's membership. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. We reaffirm our desire to build diverse Christian communities where God's love is in action. We promise to participate in the ministries of the church faithfully and engage in spiritual practices to worship, study, serve, give, and share so that we will glorify God through Jesus Christ in everything. The God of all grace who has called you, us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you in the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace. Friends, as we have welcomed these new members uh, formally, I invite you to welcome them informally with a round of applause as I head back to the seats and afterwards that you might greet them after the worship service. Welcome Paul and Jeannie and Margie. Thank you. We'll have another new member Sunday coming up in a couple months. We'll see information in the days ahead. If you're interested in being part of the member of Susanna Wesley, I invite you to connect with me in the days ahead. We also want to let you know about some upcoming events in the life of the church, opportunities to be a part of the community and to grow in our faith. One of those uh, coming up next week, we uh, are having uh, some staff transition. We want to honor and uh, say thank you to Carrie Reardon um, for our work of communications director for a number of years here at Susanna Wesley. Um, Next Sunday, we'll have a chance for you to say thank you formally to her. I invite you to bring a card or a gift, a sign of appreciation. Uh, We'll gather uh, in the atrium to say thank you to her next week. Also, we are preparing to celebrate Easter here in a few weeks, and we are uh, going to be uh, purchasing live Easter lilies, and we invite you to help make that possible. If you'd like to uh, help make that happen, they're $20 a piece, and we'll invite you to uh, sign up on the Church Center app or, uh, or uh, register there. Uh, place reservations for these flowers through April 2nd, and then after Easter Sunday, on Easter Sunday, we'll decorate our chancel, and then after Easter Sunday, you can take it home with you and enjoy it at your home. So we invite you to be a part of um, helping make this uh, worship space beautiful for Easter Sunday. We also want to invite you to these regular practices to worship, study, serve, give, and share. As our new members have made a commitment to do that, I want to remind you about what it means to give. We create a rhythm of generosity in our lives as we share our resources and our gifts. And for every one of these, we invite you to do it both on your own and with other people. And we invite you to give on your own through five acts of generosity each month, doing something above and beyond what you might normally do, maybe leaving an extra generous tip next time that you have the opportunity. And then we invite you to give with others to support God's work through our church. Primarily, this happens through giving to our ministry funding plan, and we have a special opportunity um, in these weeks to give to our Worship Center 2022 project. If you are able to go above and beyond that, your regular gift, we invite you to consider that as well. 
And now as we consider these ways that we might live as followers of Jesus, we come to our time of prayer. And uh, during this time of prayer, we are gonna, um, there's going to be a variety of opportunities for you to pray. We invite you to pray uh, with your eyes open um, or closed. Um, also, there's candles here at the front. There's one lit on either side. Um, we're going to invite you, if you'd like, to come forward and light a candle um, and place it here in the sand. Uh, we invite you to do that. So our time of prayer will begin with some quiet and inviting you to light a candle, perhaps, or to pray for those names that you see on the screen. We're praying for them for a variety of reasons. And maybe you want to sit in your, uh, where you are, and, and that's okay, too. After some time of quiet where you can speak to God on your own, where you can light a candle, remember those on the screen, I'll guide us together in a time of prayer, and we'll conclude in that way. So I invite you to know that God's presence is with us here and now, and to enter into this time of prayer. Will you pray with me? O oh God of ever-flowing grace, you fill our every need and satisfy our every hunger, and we gather to feast on your goodness. Our mouths are filled with praise for your glorious name. From generation to generation, you have sustained your people. In the deserts of life, you bring forth springs of water. When we encounter the storms of life, you are our refuge. You nurture us as your beloved, but there are times when we don't bear fruit. Sometimes we aren't satisfied. We seek out the comforts of this earth, and at times we even dishonor you, the giver of every good and perfect gift. We're liable for judgment, and we're aware of the mistakes that we've made. So forgive our sin and free us to follow with joy in the way that you would have us to go. Keep your judgment from us, O merciful God. Led and sustained by your Spirit, your church has continued even unto this day, and we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit that we may be your witnesses, calling all of the nations of the world to come to you, starting with our neighbors here in Shawnee County. Your tender mercy and compassion extend beyond our ability to understand. And we commit to your loving care today, and we offer our loved ones whom we bring before you. O oh God, be their help. Take them in the shadow of your wings. Uphold them with your strength and give them courage to face their challenges. Give healing to the sick, peace to the dying, and comfort for those who mourn. We pray all of this and ask that you help us to rejoice anew in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you've connected with us in worship, either in person or online, we invite you to check in and let us know that you're here today. If it's your first time here, you can assign the, uh, the attendance form out at the worship table. Um, you can fill out the attendance form online at our website. If you have already downloaded the Church Center app, you can use it to check in anytime today and let us know whether you're here in person or online. And we also, uh, while you're in the Church Center app, invite you to consider giving to support God's work through our church. Every dollar that you give helps us to make disciples of Jesus Christ, to be a part of God's transformation of the world, to put God's love in action in our community. You can give in the Church Center app. You can text any dollar amount to 84321, and you can uh, drop off a check uh, here at the church in the basket on the table and the welcome table, or you can mail it in here as well. And no matter how you give, 
you're part of helping our ministry happen here at Susanna Wesley. And as you take the opportunity to check in and perhaps make an offering to support God's work, well, I'd like to invite the choir forward to sing together, Create in Me a Clean Heart, O God. I invite you to join with me in our prayer of thanksgiving as you'll find the words on the screen. Patient and merciful God, we bring our offerings humbly on this day, hoping they will be a part of the ministry of your church on earth. We have not always set our priorities on bearing good fruit, yet you are a patient gardener. You have sent saints into our midst to make the soil richer Yet, like the stubborn fig tree, good fruit has been scarce. May our journey this Lenten season feed our spirits to bring forth the fruit you desire. We pray in the name of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able for our closing song today.
Go now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.